Good morning, everybody. <laughs> just in case you didn't notice, I said good morning. Just, you know, just see if you're paying attention. <laughs> good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to see everyone here this evening. And uh, just thought we'd start off with uh, a few announcements before we uh, dive into our time of uh, singing and prayer and then Bible study. I uh, wanted to let you know of, uh, of a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, there's a brother here, Kevin Hockett, who's been uh, visiting with us off and on for a few months, and uh, he, this past Sunday, placed membership with us. Uh, his contact information will be in the bulletin, and uh, so look forward to, uh, if you don't know him yet, get a chance to know him. He's a nice fellow. Uh, his name is Kevin Hockett. Kevin Hockett. Uh, next Wednesday, a week from today, is going to be Singing Wednesday. And so I just thought I'd let you know that. Uh, we're going to be spending our time in praise. We're going to be singing a lot of familiar tunes, uh, a lot of familiar hymns, but also be learning a few new ones. So be looking forward to that. This Sunday, speaking of things to look forward to, is going to be uh, Birthday Cake Sunday. So after worship services on Sunday evening, we'll be gathering for a little bit of fellowship and cake and, and all that good stuff. It's always a great time had by all. A couple of extra notes with regard to people's health. Uh, Donna Elliott has a herniated disc, and she's going to be undergoing surgery on September 7th. So please. This is this this Friday? Okay, so so that's wrong. I guess it would be, uh, yeah, the 27th. 27th, okay, so August 27th. Uh, but her brother also, Michael Joe, is in the hospital with COVID, and uh, although at first he wasn't doing so well, he's doing a whole lot better now, so we have something to be thankful for to the Lord. All right. Yes, ma'am. Ah, I'm sorry to hear that. So, uh, shingles. Her mother has shingles. And as anyone who's ever had it before knows, ouch. Uh, really, uh, it's good to have Elizabeth back with us, by the way. And... and uh, are there any other announcements that we need to make before we dive off? Yes, sir. Ah, yes. Joe Cloud and Lori are, uh, have COVID, as you know. Uh, Lori is in the hospital. Uh, Joe is at home, but he's... Oh, he went in the hospital tonight. I did not know that. Okay. So we need to be praying for the clouds. Uh, whoever's leading our prayer in just a few moments, please be sure to remember the clouds in your prayers, as well as Elizabeth's mother and Donna Elliott and her brother. Please keep them all in, in mind. Well, without any further ado, why don't we sing a song or two? We'll have a prayer, and then we'll dive. Yes, ma'am. I'll tell you what, why, since well, there's so many prayer requests in this regard, let's start off with a word of prayer, shall we? Our beloved Father, we're grateful to you for so many different things. We realize that every good thing in our life comes from you. But Father, you've invited us so thankfully to present our petitions before you. And Father, we have a number of petitions that we'd like to ask you to grant with regard to so many people that are undergoing health issues. We pray for Donna Elliott, who's going to be undergoing surgery for a herniated disc. We pray, Father, you'd give the surgeons um, sharpness and, and the ability to know what to do in case of emergency. But, Father, as always, you're the great healer, and so we ask your blessing uh, in, in helping her to, to, to do better. Father, we're grateful that her brother, Michael Joe, is, who's in the hospital with COVID, is, is doing better. We thank you for that. Um, Father, we pray for uh, Elizabeth's mother, who is uh, who has shingles, Father, we ask for a quick healing for her because that is really so painful. Father, we ask that you would please bless Sarai and, and the girls, uh, and that whole family, uh, as they have some concerns about COVID uh, and being exposed to that disease. Father, please uh, protect them from that. Um, and if Father, they've already got it, we pray for a quick resolution and and a quick restoration of good health to them all. 
Father, we're grateful for Elizabeth's return back to us. And Father, we ask you these things all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our great High Priest and Mediator. In his name, amen. Didn't ask beforehand. Have we got an opening prayer? That must be it. We'll begin our song service tonight with number 416, please. Number 416. Footsteps of Jesus. Got some of the oldies tonight, the old goodies. Mm -hmm. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling Listen closely and, and apply these things to our lives, even if it means that we need to make corrections. Father, be with us, that we would be open in our minds and in our hearts. Teach us the truth of your word. Father, for all those whose names have been brought before us, not only this evening, but those that continue to be in need, that are mentioned in our bulletin, we pray that you would bless them as only you can, that you would bring healing that you would give forgiveness and guidance to them and each one of us as well. We ask that as we go through the furtherance of this service now, Father, that you would bless us, that as we depart from this place, you'd go with us to guide us and guard us in our lives, especially from disease, from injury, and, of course, from the COVID-19 virus. We ask all of these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Number 383, Jesus, keep me near the cross. 383. 
83. Jesus, keep Mark in your hymnals number 923, I am coming Lord. Number 923 will be our song after we study. And before Bible study, um, I neglected to mention the clouds and prayers. Would you bow with me again in prayer? Our Holy Father, we come before your throne once again. We want to ask you, Father, to give a special blessing to, to uh, Joe and Lori Cloud, who are uh, sick enough to be in the hospital with COVID. Father, we pray, please, that you would strengthen them in their physical bodies, that you would bless the doctors and nurses that are attending to them, be able to do the right things that would help them the very most. Father, we ask you please to, to uh, with your great power, heal them. We pray, Father, that you would uh, watch over and bless them and help them uh, during times when, when they may be in pain. We pray that you would uh, uh, please help them to know and to remember your love, first and foremost, but our love and concern for them as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are in uh, the book of Titus, and we are in 
chapter 3, still. Uh, <laughs> uh, Linda Stennett was uh, teasing me this afternoon and telling me that she was ready for Titus chapter 4. Because uh, we do seem to, seem to spend uh, quite a bit of time in just a few few verses. But uh, this evening in particular, we're going to be starting uh, in, uh, in verse 8. But uh, again, for the purposes of making sure that we get the, the context here, because you know, in order to be able to really understand what's going on truly, it's important for us to understand what the context is, because the things that are being said are, are being said in, in the midst of a whole lot of other things, and in order to understand the pieces, we have to understand the larger part. It's like taking a, <laughs> taking a piece of a jigsaw puzzle and saying, yeah, I think I know what that is, <laughs> but you don't really, not unless you've got the entire context, right? So, that being said, let's take a look at chapter 3, starting in verse 1, reading down to the end, but we're going to be focusing and starting our study in verse 8. Paul says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we'd be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so they will not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Paul in verse 8 starts off by telling them that this is a trustworthy Statement. What's a trustworthy statement? What's that? No flaws. no flaws in it. A trustworthy statement is one that you can bank. believe in. You can bank on it. This is something that really is true. And a lot of times whenever the Apostle Paul is, is talking, because there are a few times in his letters, especially when he's talking to Timothy and Titus, when he makes mention of a trustworthy statement. Um... And by the way, this also seems to sort of indicate that whenever he talks about this being a trustworthy statement, that he might actually be quoting something else that the church, especially in the first century, kind of already knew about. Uh, one example of that is in, is in the book of Timothy, where, let's see if I can find it just real quick. I didn't think to look it up, because I didn't think about using it as a... Okay, look to chapter, uh, 2 Timothy, just a couple of pages over. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and starting in verse 11. Here Paul says, it is a trustworthy statement. Okay, well, what trustworthy statement are we talking about here? For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now, I know what it looks like in the New American Standard Version. 
Anybody else here have a different version than the New American Standard Version? I know you do. <laughs> Mr. King James. Uh, that, that, does, it, is, does it just appear as just plain old text, or does it appear to be almost in poetry form? In the New International, it's written in stanzas. Yeah, it's written in stanzas because in Greek, it, it kind of has the feel. It has the rhythm of poetry. Well, was there early Christian poetry? Well, apparently so, and probably took the form of, he wouldn't want to take a wild stab at it, a song, a hymn, yeah. And so sometimes these trustworthy, this was a, this was a trustworthy statement, and it could have come in the, in the form of, of a hymn, but notice something here also about it. It almost ends up being something like a confession, right? It's almost a confession of faith. Uh, now, it's certainly not, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, like that, but it's a confession of faith that apparently a lot of early Christians were familiar with, and that's why Paul quotes it here, and he says, this is a trustworthy statement. With that in mind, then, taking a look at the book of Titus, what is he making reference to when he says, this is a trustworthy statement? What just happened just above it, Right? That wonderful section that we were just studying that talked about how it is that, that uh, he saved us, and it probably ends up um, starting about verse 4, right? When the kindness of God, our, uh, of, of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of faith, I'm sorry, on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of generation, renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, so that being justified by his grace, we be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So there is a possibility that this statement right in there in particular may have been also something, maybe not like a formal confession, because the you know creeds and so forth didn't really even arise until like the third or fourth centuries. But a statement of faith that perhaps the church in some of its early forms might have been familiar with. And the reason that he's quoting it here and telling them this is a trustworthy statement because, you know, you would kind of expect that Titus would assume that anything the Apostle Paul said would be trustworthy, right? So why is he saying this is a trustworthy statement? Well, it's because something they already knew, and Paul is simply saying, you can bank on this one. This is a, this is a trustworthy statement. This is... This is, maybe, maybe it might not have been said or put together by someone who was inspired, but an inspired man quoted it, so it must be good, right? So that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Right. He's, he's, saying, he, he's saying, this is what we just got through saying here. This is a trustworthy statement. Being a trustworthy statement, he says, I want you to do what with it? I want you to teach it. I want you to remind them of it. I want you to kind of, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I think it's pretty accurate. I want you to drill it into their heads. Why? Why did he want them to remember it? Why did he want them to really teach this? Teach it hard. That they might not fall away. Yeah. Yeah, they want to, want to keep them focused. On, on. And focused in particular, take a look at what it says. I want you to speak these things confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. All right, think about... Think about this whole context that we're taking a look at here. He started off in, in the early part of this chapter by saying, you know, we need to be praying for authorities and all kinds of other people, and we need to not have a bad attitude about them because, he says, once upon a time, you and I were just as dumb. You and I had made just the same stupid mistakes. You and I found ourselves just as sinful as any of the rest of these guys have done. But... 
when the kindness of God came along, oh man, we were saved not on the basis of our deeds, but on the basis of faith and grace and God's mercy and kindness. That's what we were saved on the basis of. How will that teaching help these people to engage in good deeds? Any ideas? Yeah they'd, want to, yeah, they'd want to be pleasing to the Lord. And, you know, they, and, and your point is, is really well taken because this is, am I the only one here that gets motivated by this whenever I read it? I'm sure I'm not. I get motivated by stuff like this because I can remember when I wasn't doing what I ought to be doing and being so grateful for what God has done knowing that I used to be engaged in all the bad stuff and now knowing that I have been saved to do what? Do the good stuff. Be engaged in good deeds. Because as we've talked about so many times before, you know, it's important for us to understand that it's not just that we need to be staying away from sin. I need to be staying away from adultery, staying away from lying, staying away from stealing, all that stuff. Sure, I need to do that. But it's more than just staying away from sin, right? By doing good stuff. Doug? Yeah, and that was the key. It's kind of a two-edged sword. But the, the bottom line is, how is it that we incorporate those good things? It's not enough not just to not do the bad thing. But what are the good things that Paul or Timothy or Titus, what they learn from this teaching? Right. What are the good things? Right. What is it? And so that's the big thing we try to get across to the, to the young people. It's not just a matter of quoting the scripture or knowing what it says or where to find it, but the effect that it has on us. Yeah. Yeah. Every day. Exactly. Romans chapter 2 and verse 7. Patience continuance in well doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, it, it really does need to be much more than just a staying away from sin. It needs to be about good deeds. Which, you know, by the way, we've already talked about this a little bit up in chapter 2 about verse, what is it, 14, where it says here it, that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us, it says, from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Because I want you to turn, I, I have redeemed you. This word redeem obviously can have a, a number of different nuances to it. Uh, when we talk about redeeming in the Old Testament, we're talking about uh, purchasing someone out of slavery or redeeming the land, buying it back for the family and things like that. But the term redeem can also mean what else, especially in a context like that? What, what do we mean whenever we say, well, I mean, I was using this the other day that I was watching, by the way, you may not know this, but uh, Hooks at New Hampshire is just north of Manchester, New Hampshire, just saying. And Hooks at New Hampshire's Little League baseball team is in, is in the finals for the Little League World Series. Woohoo! But anyway, I was watching it the other night, and, uh, and, and, and the kid that was out in, in, uh, in left field, no, right field, uh, had, a, had a fly hit out to him, and it looked like it was going to be an easy catch, but he dropped it. And some kids scored and stuff like that. Well... You know, of course, as, as, as a kid, if you've ever watched Little League Baseball, oh, man, the, the kids are like, you know, <laughs> like that with emotions and so forth. And so he was just like really down on himself. But a little bit later on, he got up to bat. Guess what he did? Home run. <laughs> and we would say about that kid, what did he do to himself? He redeemed himself, all right? He used to be bad, now he did something really good and proved himself worthy and useful, right? That, that's kind of what it is. And in a similar sort of way, when it talks here about how we have been redeemed by Christ from those old things and now have been redeemed to do those things, it's talking about that turnaround. No longer are we enslaved to the old deeds anymore. We have been bought back so we can do the good things. Be zealous for those things. I'm reminded of the, that scripture that tells about the, the man that uh, got, got rid of the demon. Then when he went back, he found it already. For, he had replaced 
Yeah. Yeah. Got a clean house. I'm going to invite some fellows over and we're going to have a party in this boy. Yeah. 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 And you know, honestly, I, in, in my, and this is just my own personal observation, uh, you can take it for what it's worth. My observation, though, and, and I think we've all known of people who mostly in their Christian life, most of their Christian life was mostly spent in making sure they didn't do the bad stuff and never really got behind getting involved in the good stuff. My observation is theirs was a very poverty-stricken Christianity. Yeah, they, there was the, their life was full of a whole lot of no, but it didn't hardly have any yeses in it at all. Well, that's just kind of heartbreaking because Jesus offers way more than just, you know, saying no all the time. It's also a whole lot more about saying yes to all the good things. Reuben? Which, so we can move on, because I do want to cover more than just verse 8. <laughs> uh, um, he goes on to talk about how it is that these good deeds are what? Good and profitable, he says, for men. In what way are these good deeds good and profitable for men? Well, it does. And I guess part of me is, is kind of wanting to ask questions like this because I'd also like to get us really motivated to do the good things. You know, because what he's offering here, what he's telling us about is if you get them to engage in good deeds, it's not just, he, he, it, it's not just about fruitfulness to the Lord, although it certainly is about that. Don't get me wrong. But it's also, it says, good and profitable. What does he mean by that? It does. You kind of get involved in things. You kind of want to do more. And, um, you know, in, in, uh, in, in I'm sure that this congregation has done it. I just haven't been around long enough to be able to see and because the time I've been here is like been in COVID, right? So, you know, a lot of things have been on hold. But in Manchester, when I was working, we used to, once in a while, actually for several years in a row, did what we called uh, um, giveaway day. And basically, we asked people to kind of empty out their basement and their attic and so forth of good stuff that they just weren't using anymore. They were just kind of hanging on to. And we, we were kind of calling kind of like a, a yard sale without price tags. And and it was it was wonderful to see the congregation get involved because the more they got involved and, and the more community people came through and the more people started, uh, started taking things and, and we were generating conversations with them and can we pray with you about stuff and, and all these things and, and seeing people who really had little or nothing being thrilled to be able to get a washing machine, you know, just thrilled at being able to get a washing machine. You know how that made the congregation feel? Oh, man, let's do some more of this. This is great because, you see, getting active like that, getting motivated, getting, uh, not just being motivated, but, but getting, doing good stuff really helps lift the spirit. My wife oftentimes ends up saying, anytime she ever kind of starts getting a little bit down and depressed, I need to start visiting people more. Why? Why does she say stuff like that? Yeah, it makes her feel better. She's doing good things. It makes her feel better. But let's take a look at the other side. Let's not be selfish. In what other ways is it good and profitable for men that we do good deeds? Well, there's that. We're laying up treasures in heaven. 
but there's also the beneficiaries of the good things that we're doing, right? Yeah. Doing good deeds does good for them and gives them just a little bit of insight into what God's people are really about. Gives you an opportunity to share the gospel. Plus it ends up making you feel better. Plus it ends up being laying up treasures in heaven. Doing good deeds, good and profitable for men. Yeah. Doug? Are you suggesting that it's more blessed to give than to receive? I am. <laughs> I am. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It just really excites people. You know, after giveaway day, people were really... Well, they were rocking. They were ready to do stuff, you know. It's too bad winter would come along pretty close after that because it kind of made people like because there's not too much you could do. Yes, sir. It, it, it may not necessarily be, you know, dollar for dollar, but certainly, exactly, exactly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's all the wrong motive. Yeah, hers was the right motive. We just need to be careful about the right, having the right one. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it's just to say, you know, which is kind of the reason I was saying, you know, that it makes us feel better, but let's just not focus on us. That, that's certainly useful. But look at what it does. Look at what it does for my Christianity. Look what it does for opportunities opening up for the gospel. Look what it does for the kingdom overall. It does so many wonderful things. And that's why he's saying it's good and profitable for men to be. And, and apparently this was not happening in Crete. And Paul was trying to kind of kickstart some of this stuff. He said, come on, guys, let's get going. It's important to do. Well, Paul moves on from there to talk about, um, he says, uh, <laughs> avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are, unpro they are unprofitable and worthless. And by the way, again, keeping context in mind, I have a hunch that there wasn't necessarily a paragraph break between these two verses, 8 and 9. Because notice what he says here. I mean, he just, there's a but there, right? Usually when you use a but, that's a, for, for those of you who are gram, grammarians, what does but usually imply? It's called a conjunction, right? <laughs> You're kind of trying to marry a couple of ideas together, as it were. But so he says, I want you to do all the I want you to teach these things and stress these things, be confident about these things, so that everyone will 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 engage in the good deeds because these things are good and profitable for men. But what apparently was happening that he wanted to stop? Foolish controversies. Let me ask the question then. What's the difference between a foolish controversy? And a serious controversy. Kind of making something out of nothing. I was I was kind of hoping that maybe someone might, in a joking sort of way, say, "Well, serious controversies are the one that I care about." Because <laughs> sometimes that's kind of the way the definition that we give things, right? Sometimes it kind of is. What were these folks apparently? doing some arguing about and controverting about if that's really a word I don't know if it is or not what's that petty. kind of petty issues he says I don't want you I don't want you fighting about genealogies or disputes with regard to the law and by the way one of the questions I, I uh, I'm asking here is also what seems to be the theme of the controversies that Paul has in mind and who would care about these sorts of things? Who would care about genealogies? 
the Jews. Who would care about, about disputes over matters of the law? The Jews. Yeah, yeah. Um, which ends up telling us a little bit of something, I think, possibly, uh, which is to say, apparently, that, that a lot of these controversies that were coming up were, in fact, kind of erupting maybe out of, maybe their source was out of the Jews. They are apparently getting, getting everyone involved in it somewhat. But, but he just wanted that sort of stuff to stop. What made them, think about it for a second, what made those controversies about genealogy and matters of the law, what made those controversies foolish? Exactly. They weren't relevant anymore. They just didn't matter anymore. And you guys are getting all wound up around the axle about things that don't even matter anymore. Disputes over the law about, you know, how far can you, can you carry something on a Sabbath day? <laughs> Who cares? And, and, and whether you happen to be related somehow or the other to Aaron? Who cares? What mattered now was New Covenant stuff. Christian stuff, church stuff. But that, of course, is not to say that in the 21st century we can't also sometimes get involved in foolish controversies, right? Is it possible to do any of that sort of stuff? Yeah. yeah. And maybe sometimes that maybe sometimes the same sort of theme ends up applying that in some cases they're really not relevant. Now, what would possibly and I'm just talking, I mean, if you want to give me a specific, that's right, that's okay. Uh, but but in, in maybe in generic terms, what kinds of controversies would be serious and possibly useful? Which one would be serious? Would be serious. Something they preferred, the, the word. Yeah. Maybe a doctrinal controversy of some sort. Where, where someone is saying, you know, no, I don't know that Jesus really is the Son of God in the sense that you're talking about it. He's not really deity. Or maybe someone, you know, to use something that's a bit more modern, maybe something about instrumental music or a cappella music or something of that nature that really is of a doctrinal uh, matter uh, or, or something that has to do with worship and how that's conducted. Um, and the reason that those things end up being relevant is because it ends up affecting all of us, right? Uh, because, and this is important, I, I say this a lot, but I, I, and I hope I'm kind of getting through, that doctrine is crucially important. It, it's kind of a, anytime you ever, <laughs> as a preacher, usually I end up saying the word doctrine, and I can almost see people's eyes glaze. <laughs> like, oh no, he's gonna get into some heavy duty theological stuff. But doctrines really are just teachings. That's all they really are. They're teachings. And teachings are important because, you see, these teachings are teaching us what to believe, and our faith, what we believe, will end up affecting now what we do, how we behave, what kinds of deeds we might get involved in. Did you notice how, what Paul's argument here was about for them getting engaged in in good deeds, it was a doctrinal motivation. If you believe this stuff, how is that going to affect you, you see? So those things being true, and they are, then doctrinal things would in fact, if there's a controversy going on, we probably need to settle that. But it is important for us to be able to discern between things that are foolish and not so foolish. The Apostle Paul had to deal with a lot of that stuff in the book of, of, of 1 Corinthians, right? Where there were some people apparently who were suing each other. And Paul says, you know, this is just dumb. Look, why not just go ahead and throw up the white flag and say, fine, I'd rather be wronged than to, than to show the, the underbelly of the church this way. That's just a bad idea. Just stop it. 
And these whole ideas about, you know, who can speak in tongues and who's going to prophesy and who's better and da 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 Paul ends up having to deal with that controversy too. And essentially, what does he tell them? Pfft. Come on, man. Every one of these gifts are important. None of them are unimportant or God wouldn't have given them to you. Exercise what you've got. Become a part of the body where you are and understand and realize that every part is absolutely necessary. So don't be worried about whether you've got the better gift or whatever one thinks is a really super spectacular sparkly gift. Do what you're supposed to do and the whole body will be happy. That was a foolish controversy, getting wound up around the axle about, about who had the greater status and all that sort of stuff. And those are the kinds of things that people still can kind of get wound up around the axle on. Foolish controversies. But I did want to go on to talk about this other thing, because, by the way, he says that these kinds of arguments really are not profitable. <laughs> they, in fact, are worthless, he says. But reject, verse 10, a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and sinning, being self-condemned. What is a factious man? And what is he doing? What's that? Always causing trouble. Always causing trouble. Yeah, because a faction basically, yes, sir? A divider. A divider. Basically, a faction is a division of something, right? And so a factious man is someone who's divided. And how, how, would, how do people divide people? How does, how does a man divide a church? Usually over some silly controversy of some sort or the other, right? That's usually kind of what it boils down to. Uh, we've all known of, of, of churches, perhaps, that, that end up getting divided because essentially one of the leaders had a personality conflict with another leader. I don't like the way you do that. I don't, like, I don't like the way that you word your prayers. Really? I don't like the way that you, you don't place the same emphasis on evangelism that I do or something. You know, There's all kinds of things that, that crop up and end up dividing churches over things like that, which is just really, really silly. Yeah. You want to meet at 9.30? Wow, the only right way to do it is 10 o'clock. Really? Okay. People get crazy about things like that. But if there's someone, I mean, okay, once in a while, maybe someone might just kind of lose their mind temporarily and become, you know, divisive over something. Um, but what does a factious man do? Division is all, he's doing it all the time. Division just seems to follow him wherever he goes. And to that, Paul has a solution. What's his solution? Which is interesting, isn't it? Don't you find it interesting? He says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. What does it mean to reject? What is he talking about here? The term, what's the term that we would use these days? Withdrawal of fellowship. And how should you do it? How soon should you do it? Pretty close to immediately after a first and second warning. Now, how does this end up work? Oh, I think I just skipped ahead without really wanting to do that. How does this end up? Oh, no, it doesn't. Why didn't, Paul's, uh, why didn't Paul recommend Jesus' formula for dealing with sinful situations, like in Matthew chapter 18, right? Matthew chapter 18, he says, if, if someone has offended you, uh, then, then you go to them personally. And then maybe you go a second time. And then you bring someone with you. And if he still doesn't repent, then you bring it to the church. And you go through this entire thing. Why doesn't Paul go with Jesus' recommendation? Why doesn't you just say, ah, check out Matthew 18? As if they could do that, right? But anyway, why didn't he just say that? Yeah, this is more of a church-wide thing, right? And this has this has the this has the danger of of being a real division in the church and being really hurtful to the church. And it's something that needs to be taken care of right now. It needs to be nipped in the bud right now. Because otherwise, what what happens if you give something like this too much time? 
it becomes a division. It does. It does indeed. Which is why it is that Paul is recommending uh, something to be done very quickly because such men, he says, are perverted. What does the word perverted mean? Yeah, I kind of turned the wrong way, kind of twisted and turned the wrong way. These people just, he, he's saying people like that just have, <laughs> we might say, kind of have a kind of have a screw loose somewhere. You know, they're just, they're, there's a little something wrong with them. They just aren't uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. All right. Well, we will finish up with um, the rest of this chapter. Um, not next week, but week after next, because next week is, is singing. But um, I just wanted to, I'm going to switch over into devotional mode here for just a moment. Um, and just to talk about uh, something I was reading today in, in our Bible reading schedule, uh, which was uh, in the book of Lamentations, actually. And uh, one, of the, one of the great passages coming out of Lamentations is something that we oftentimes sing as a song, right? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It comes right out of Lamentations. And it comes right out of the middle of an almost hopeless, desperately gloomy and, 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 and terribly tragic section of Scripture. Lamentations is a really good name for the book. Um, in fact, earlier on in chapter 3, Jeremiah even says, man, I'm just like right on the ragged verge of just losing all hope altogether. At which point, however, along comes this wonderful, wonderful section. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope. In him. The reason I just find that so wonderful is because, of course, we all end up hitting situations in our life that sometimes can cause us to become perhaps a bit hopeless, wondering if something, if, if anything good will ever come out of the situation that we're in. Here's the good news. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Or perhaps, perhaps your life. I've met people before who, as I've mentioned before in other, other lessons, uh, have, have told me, you know, I just don't know how the Lord could ever possibly forgive me. You just don't know what I've done. To them, what's the answer? Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. And if you believe in him, you can have that hope. This evening, if you've been thinking about some of these things, maybe there are things in your life that you know you need to turn around. Maybe you think that might be hopeless. I'll never be able to conquer that. The answer is, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Turn it over to God and watch what he does. If you need to become a Christian and maybe wondering whether God can forgive you of all the things that you've done and, and make it possible for you to go to heaven, don't lose hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. In him, there is hope. So place your faith in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Confess him as Lord. Obey him in baptism and follow him faithfully. This evening, if you need to respond, we encourage you to come forward while we stand and sing this song together. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee.
if there's anything else, any announcements, things that we need to be made aware of. Of course, uh, the word is out that we've got uh, birthday cakes coming up here pretty soon, singing coming up pretty soon, so everybody pick out a song or two that they want us to practice, and we will do that. Matter of fact, we will, uh, oh, I would encourage everyone to be sure and have a good week. Take the word with you. Uh, remember, uh, Lord's Day is coming up. Live righteously in between time. The last song tonight before our closing prayer, if you would turn to number 123. Uh, in light of our lesson tonight, this would be a really good song to close with. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never Merciful and all wise from the Father. Again, we approach thy throne of mercy and grace. Thanking you for this lovely day that you've restored upon us, Heavenly Father, a day that we will never see again. And we pray, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you brought us together, Heavenly Father, to study your holy and divine word. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for the things that we studied, Heavenly Father, we according to your word, your will, your way, that we would put it in perspective, Heavenly Father, and let it germinate germinate deep down in our hearts and bring us forth fruit to our most holy and righteous name. And we thank you for your man serving Brother Parks as he continued to bring these lessons. We pray on the Father to continue to be with him and crown his head with the wisdom and knowledge that he would continue to impart in such a way, Heavenly Father, that the least among us will understand your holy and divine word before it's everlasting and eternity too late. And those that hear your word, Heavenly Father, would put it in perspective, Heavenly Father, and realize, Heavenly Father, they have a God to serve and a soul to save. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those that know not you in the pardon of their sins, that they come to the realization, Heavenly Father, that they may put you on in baptism, Heavenly Father, for the remission of their sins. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for this shrewd and cruel world. We pray for those, Heavenly Father, that make decisions of us, Heavenly Father. We pray that you be with the people, Heavenly Father, in the controversy that's going on in this low and sinful world. We are living in perilous times, Heavenly Father, but we pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with them, Heavenly Father. Help them to realize they, too, have to stand before the judgment bar and give account of the things that they've done in this body, whether they be good or bad. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of this service, Heavenly Father, that you continue to wrap your love and arms of protection around us and no hurt, harm, or dungeons that come among us. And continue to pray, ask the prayers that was requested Heavenly Father for those that are sick and afflicted, especially those that are in this particular congregation. You know each and every one of them by name, Heavenly Father. You know they desire, you know they need, you know they wants. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with them collectively, Heavenly Father, and restore them back to their much wanted and needed help. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we're about to separate one from another, to go to our several homes of a board, 
pray that you watch over and protect us and guide us to the next appointed time. For we ask all these blessings and other blessings that we may be permitted to render unto you. For we ask it on your son's sweet and precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen.